Okay, so to cheer you all up today, we have the book of Kohelet. The words that this is a Jewish tradition holds that Solomon wrote this in his old age. That he wrote the Song of Songs when he was a young man, and Kohelet when he was an old day, in, in old age. Um, now, I'd say we can safely say that whoever wrote this, it wasn't Solomon. There are Persian loan words in it, like pardes, the word for a garden. It cannot be earlier than the Persian period. I think more probably, it was probably in the Hellenistic period, where you have already some smattering of Greek philosophy. One of the main issues in the book is whether people can hope for a meaningful afterlife, whether there is a judgment of the dead, whether there is reward or punishment. And Kohelet takes a very negative position on that. But at the same time, you can see that it was being discussed at the time when he wrote. Now, that we don't really have evidence of that being discussed until, the, say, the third century at the earliest. Uh, so maybe somewhere in the third century, conceivably even early second century BC, but uh, somewhere in there. Uh, Koheleth, spelled in the Hebrew Q O H E L E T. H. And the, then also known as Ecclesiastes. Uh, Ecclesiastes is a, what assembly person, something like that. You see the word, the Hebrew word kahal, the first three consonants of Kohelet mean assembly. Uh, the oddity is the form Kohelet looks like a feminine uh, participle. And that doesn't make any sense. So it's a bit of a puzzle as to how he gets that name. Uh, he does make a pretense, though not a heavy pretense, I would say, of being Solomon. He claims to have been king in Jerusalem. And uh, so that that is how he was regarded then in the, the tradition. Uh, it's, the, it's difficult to say much about a structure in the book. You know, it's basically a collection of sentences. Uh, the first half of it hammers away at the theme, vanity of vanities, a doll is vanity. And then in the second half of the book, the theme is how you cannot find out, no matter how hard you look. The book begins with a poem and ends with a poem. And beyond that, as I say, there's not really that much structure to it. In fact, to have a structure would be kind of counter to the whole philosophy of the book, because it's a book largely about me the lack of meaningfulness, meaninglessness, although it's not actually as negative on that in the end as it might initially seem. So... The words now, uh, the NRSV translates the teacher, but there's no good justification for that. So we'll just call him Koheleth. Son of David, king in Jerusalem. Uh, well, that's pretending to be Solomon. Vanity of vanities and all is vanity. And what is vanity? The Hebrew word is hevel, and it means something like a mist. And the point of it is, all is transitory. It's like the mist that blows away. And this is really the major theme of the book. Now, you know, up to this point in the Hebrew Bible, or Old Testament, the common belief is, when you die, you go to Sheol. It's no fun being in Sheol. It's nothing to look forward to. In Sheol, you become a shade. That's all. You can't even praise God in Sheol. They just said in credit for credit, no credit, for Old Testament, you either have to do the exegesis or the final exam. Um, 
you know you can be heard all over so <laughs> okay uh, so the, the problem of the book is you know up to this point as they say nobody believed hardly anybody believed that they had any kind of meaningful afterlife to look forward to but uh, it didn't seem to bother people that deeply because the way you looked for your immortality in the ancient world was through your children. People thought of themselves as part of a larger unit. Now, in the case of Kohelet, that seems to have broken down. And this actually also happened more broadly in the Greek world. There's been a lot written on that. Uh, people were more scattered. There were more people living away from home in the uh, Hellenistic period. People talk about the breakdown of the polis of the Greek city-state. Uh, but for whatever reason, you get a rise in belief in an afterlife. Now, some people always had some in Egypt. Now, not that everybody necessarily did. Uh, but certainly there was a long tradition of belief in a meaningful afterlife in Egypt. And of course, you get Plato's idea of the immortality of the soul back already uh, in a couple of hundred years before this. But in the Hellenistic period, there does seem to be a rise in that belief. And Koheleth uh, isn't, isn't buying it. So, he says, what do people gain from all the toil at which they toil under the sun? Uh, I would admit, you know, this is not a book to give people when they're applying to graduate school. It doesn't really encourage you a whole lot in the possibilities of what you may hope to achieve. Uh, but the, the way he puts it here, what do people gain? Now, there again, you may have an indication of a new world order in the Hellenistic age, where there was more entrepreneurship. People could go out and do things to make a profit. They had more business. Coinage became common. Now, so you know, the, his question in a way is, what profit do you get out of life? And that's where he comes up against a brick wall. Because, he says, in the end, you can't take anything with you. So a generation comes, a generation goes, but the earth remains forever. Now, this, of course, is flatly contradictory to what you'll find in the New Testament. And for that of it, in a book like Daniel, where the, the world is passing away. But this was probably more typical of the way people thought throughout the Hebrew Bible than throughout the ancient world, that the world remains forever. Even in the time of Christ, the philosopher Philo in Alexandria said that in theory it's possible that God could destroy the world, but why would he? It's such a perfect thing. So he also thought the world would last forever. All things are wearisome, more than one can express. What has been is what will be. What has been done is what will be done. There is nothing new under the sun. Now, this again, I would say, is common ancient Near Eastern wisdom. That's generally speaking what people believed. I think this has been true in many traditional societies. In the modern Western world, we don't believe that at all. We believe it's always possible to come up with something new. We believe it's even possible to come up with something new if you're writing an exegesis paper on the Old Testament. But Koheleth knew better. He said, if you think you've come up with something new, it's just because you haven't read enough. Somebody surely said that before. <laughs> now, so, but as I say, this is very typical of the attitude in the ancient world. Everything is given. You have to kind of fit into it. I, Koheleth, when king over Israel and Jerusalem, applied my mind to seek and to search out by wisdom all that is done under heaven. Now, I've commented on this already because this was a, an axiom, I would say, 
of the wisdom tradition that wisdom comes from experience, from observation. And as we saw in the book of Proverbs, this isn't always true, that a good deal of what they come up with actually seems to be repeating dogmas from one generation to another. But at least they claimed that everything was based on observation. In a book like Proverbs, you don't question the transmitted wisdom of your forefathers. This is also the case with the friends of Job. This is their complaint about Job. Who are you to question what all the generations have said? You should just accept it. The distinctive thing about Kohelet is he wants to check things out for himself. And so he says, I applied my mind to search out wisdom. And I said to myself, I have acquired great wisdom, surpassing all who were over Jerusalem before me. And my mind has had great experience of wisdom and knowledge. And I applied my mind to know wisdom and to know madness and folly. And I perceived that this also is but a chasing after wind. In other words, that even if he does know what wisdom and folly are, it doesn't really get him anywhere. Now, at the uh, beginning then of chapter two, he goes on and recounts uh, some of the experiments that he carried out for himself. Come now, I'll make a test of pleasure. And again, this also was vanity. Now, why would he say that pleasure is vanity? Well, the point is, you don't gain anything by it. There is no profit in it. And this, I think, is what sours his initial inquiry, is that he is looking for something that you can claim is left over at the end, something that you have gained from it. Uh, so what use is it? I search my mind how to cheer my body with wine, my mind still guiding me with wisdom. You see, this is his problem. He never really relaxes. Even if you're trying to get pleasure in wine, well, if you're still thinking about it and asking, now, what am I gaining by this? It takes the good out of it. Uh, how, so I built houses and planted vineyards. I made pools. I bought male and female slaves and so forth. I gathered to myself so, uh, silver and gold. I got singers, men and women, and many concubines. But wherever my eyes desired, I did not keep from them. And then I considered all that my hands had done and the toil I had spent in doing it. And again, all was vanity and chasing after wind. So was Solomon such a great man? Well, in the end, he says, no. And why? Because in the end, Solomon dies like everybody else. So I turn to consider wisdom and madness and folly. For what can one do who comes after the king? Only what has been already done. And then I saw that wisdom excels folly as light ex excels darkness. The wise have eyes in their head, but fools walk in darkness. Okay. That is something that he will actually come back to quite a bit in this, that you can still, some things are still better than others. So he's not saying that everything is equally meaningless. Uh, but he says, then I said to myself, what happens to the fool will also happen to me. So why have I been so very wise? And I said to myself, this also is vanity. For there is no enduring remembrance of the wiser of fools, seeing in the days to come all will have been long forgotten. How can the wise die like the fool? So I hated life because what is done under the sun was grievous to me. Now, I would underline this is not actually his final conclusion. It's his preliminary conclusion. Because what he learns eventually is that he's asking the wrong question. That it's not what profit you can gain. That you've got to 
actually enjoy the experience. But insofar as he was looking for profit, he says, Solomon didn't do any better than anybody else in the end of the day, because death is the great leveler. So uh, in verse 24, chapter 2, verse 24, there is nothing better for mortals than to eat and drink and find enjoyment in their toil. This also I saw from the, is from the hand of God. For apart from him, who can eat or have enjoyment? For to the one who pleases him, God gives wisdom and knowledge and joy. But to the sinner, he gives work of gathering and heaping, only to give it to one who pleases God. And then he says, this also is vanity and chasing after wind. And what isn't clear there is what this time is he saying is vanity and chasing after wind. Is it he, get work of gathering and heaping? Or is it trying to find any logic in it? Is it, is it that the idea itself that God gives pleasure to those who please him and gives the labor of gathering and frustration to those who don't, is it that conclusion itself that's vanity and chasing after wind? And I rather suspect that it's the latter. We'll come back again. I mean, what you've got there in verse 24 and following, in a way, is his bottom line. That, that there is nothing better than to enjoy life while you can. Now, this, you will, if you remember, you probably back at the beginning of the course talked a little bit about the Epic of Gilgamesh, where Gilgamesh went in search of, um, uh, went, went in search of uh, the meaning of life and at one point confides in a barmaid who sets him straight on it saying, the life that you seek you cannot find. And what he should do is, you know, enjoy the life that he has. That's the bottom line in Gilgamesh. The search for eternal life is doomed to frustration. And this also, I think, is the, the conclusion of Kohelet. Whether he got it from Gilgamesh, that's a different question, because you'd get very much the same thing there in Egypt, there are poems called the Songs of the Harper that were inscribed in tombs in Egypt that come pretty much to that conclusion as well. Uh, you also get something like it in Epicurean philosophy, where Epicurus thought that people just needed to get rid of the idea that there was any kind of judgment after death. That's only a source of worry and unhappiness, and rather focus on the moment. Chapter 3 may be the most famous passage in the book of Koheleth. <clears throat> for everything there is a season and a time for every matter under heaven. A time to be born, a time to die. A time to kill and a time to heal. A time to mourn and a time to dance. A time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing. A time to seek, a time to lose. A time to keep silence, a time to speak. A time to love and a time to hate. A time to keep, uh, uh, a time for war and a time for peace. Now, is he being unorthodox in that, do you think? See, I think actually he is not. But if you get in the Pentateuch, you, know, you have the Decalogue, which sound like very absolute commandments. Uh, now, and then you have case laws that you know, qualify everything by the circumstances. And I think he's on the same page as the case laws. You know, that everything depends on timing. This was also true even in Proverbs, where you can get contradictory Proverbs placed side by side. So should you answer a fool according to his folly? 
Well, it depends. It depends on the particular circumstances of the occasion. So I think he was actually fairly typical of the whole biblical tradition in that regard. Even a time to hate as well as a time to love, a time to kill as well as a time to cure. So there is nothing that is totally off limits in principle. It's the, you've always got to consider the circumstances of it. What, and then he comes back to his usual question, what gain have the workers from their toil? I have seen the business that God has given people to be busy with. So according to Kohelet, what are we all doing? Basically, finding ways to pass the time, to be busy with. He has made everything suitable for its time. And moreover, now the NRSV says he has put a sense of past and future in their mind. What the Hebrew has there, he has put ha-olam in their mind. And olam is sometimes translated eternity. Now, most people would say you don't really have a concept of eternity in, in the ancient Semitic world. You know, God lasts forever, but forever is still time. Whereas eternity is really out of time. But I'd say that what, what he means here is that he has given people a sense that there is some kind of total meaning, but he hasn't made it possible for people to grasp it. Now, this, in a way, again, is disputing what you had in Proverbs, where wisdom you know, reveals itself. If you follow wisdom, the implication is you get the whole picture. Next week, we'll talk about a later wisdom book, The Wisdom of Solomon, which is very emphatic that a person who has wisdom can understand pretty much everything. Look, not all details necessarily, but the big picture, how it all hangs together. But for Koheleth, I think that's what you cannot get, and that's what makes it all frustrating. I know that there is nothing better for them to be happy and enjoy themselves as long as they live. Moreover, it's God's pleasure that you should eat and drink. Uh, going on, and it does become a little bit uh, repetitive. He said, under the sun, that in the place of justice there is wickedness. They said in my heart, God will judge the righteous and the wicked. And I said in my heart, with regard to human beings, God is testing them to show that they are but animals. For the fate of humans and animals is the same. As the one dies, so dies the other. They all have the same breath. Humans have no advantage over the animals, for all is vanity. All go to one place, all are from the dust, and all turn to dust again. Who knows whether the spirit, the human spirit, goes upward and the spirit of animals goes downward to the earth. Now, this, I think, is a, an indication that this book wasn't written before the Hellenistic period, probably not before the third century, because before that time, nobody, the only people in the biblical tradition who were thought to have gone up were Elijah and Enoch, maybe Moses, but that was it. But now, beginning in the Hellenistic period, probably in the third century already, you get traditions about Enoch. And I will get in a little bit of those before the end of the course. This is the apocalyptic literature which would become enormously important because it really gives you the framework in which Christianity emerged. But according to the apocalyptic literature, Enoch had gone up to heaven, and when he died, was taken up to heaven. And this becomes a paradigm that other people can imitate. Now, I figure that 
theory was being expounded already when Koheleth wrote. And Koheleth's answer to it is, who knows? Who knows whether the spirit of a man goes up or the spirit of a, and the spirit of a beast goes down? Now, uh, you know, some people, and maybe Christians especially, uh, say, well, let's believe that it does. You know, let's give it the benefit of the doubt. Kohelet would say, no. You know, go with the assured minimum. What do your eyes tell you? What do you have evidence for? And that inclines him to the view that there really isn't a difference in the end between, uh, between human beings and, uh, and animals. And in that case, what are you left to do? There is nothing better than that all should enjoy their work, for that is their lot. Who can bring them to see what will be after them? Now, in chapter 4, then he tries out, uh, as he will again later in the book, some qualified advice. You know, there may be no absolute truths, but at least some things are better than others. So uh, he says, I saw fools fold their hand and consume their own flesh. Better is a handful with quiet than two handfuls with toil. Um, in chapter 4, verse 9, two are better than one because they have a good reward for their toil. He is still looking for a prophet. If they fall, one will lift up the other. You become more conscious of this when you get older. But woe to one who is alone and falls and does not have another to help. Again, if two lie together, they keep warm. But how can one keep warm alone? Now, have you ever seen that quoted in the context of biblical sexual ethics? Not sure that I have, but I think, you know, this is, this is Kohelet's viewpoint on it. It's the utterly kind of practical side of wisdom that it's better keep warm. Uh, and though one may prevail against another, two will withstand one, a threefold cord is not quickly broken. Again, this is qualified advice. It's limited wisdom. In chapter 5, he takes up the question of religious observance. Guard your steps when you go to the house of God. To draw near to listen is better than the sacrifice offered by fools, for they do not know how to keep from doing evil. Never be rash with your mouth, nor let your heart be quick to utter your word from God. For God is in heaven, and you are on earth. Let your words be few. Dreams, can you get revelations in dreams? Well, not according to Koheleth. Dreams come with many cares, and a fool's voice with many words. We'll see Ben Sira, who wrote maybe a hundred years later, uh, also is very negative on dreams, whereas in the apocalyptic literature, dreams are a medium of revelation. That's how you get revelation into the heavens. When you make a vow to God, do not delay fulfilling it, for he has no pleasure in fools. Fulfill what you vow. It is better that you should not vow than that you should vow and not fulfill it. So, you can see he doesn't have a lot of time for people running after the temple. He doesn't have a, a lot of time, you know, for people even probably praying. Because he figures, you know, he's informed by fear of the Lord, properly understood. Fear of the Lord means keep your head down. You don't want to get God's attention. Now, you will notice that in this, the Hebrew wisdom tradition, in, that is Proverbs, Job, Koheleth. There is no talk at all of loving God. What your proper attitude to God is fear. You know, God is like a king. 
like uh, president, best thing to do is not get his attention. Keep your head down, stay out of trouble's way. Now, in the second half of the book, then, he goes on with a little bit more um, of the type that one thing is better than another, even though it may not, uh, it may, uh, may not be uh, absolutely good. Uh, some of his judgments on that, you may question. Well, a good name is better than precious ointment. At the day of death than the day of birth. That sounds very pessimistic, but you see, it's very much, um, it's very traditional wisdom in a way in the ancient world. Where you get that a lot is in Greek tragedy. Not to be born is the best thing. But that usually comes, you know, in a story kind of like the book of Job, after the sky has fallen in on you. You know, when great disaster befalls, you can understand somebody saying it would have been better not to be born at all. Uh, this uh, sorrow, he says, is better than laughter, for by sadness of countenance, the heart is made glad. You're less likely to be disappointed. Do not be quick to anger, verse 9, for anger lodges in the bosom of fools. Um, so in my vein, well, let's see what they want to go to here. Um, yeah, in 7.15, in my vain life, I have seen everything. There are righteous people who perish in their righteousness, and there are wicked people who prolong their life in their evil doing. This is very much in line with Job, you know, and again, you've got to credit him with honesty on this. He's not going to sugarcoat his account of life. Um, do not be too righteous. And do not act too wise. Why should you destroy yourself? Is it possible to be too righteous? Any of you know anybody who is too righteous? Or have you ever met somebody who was too righteous? My guess is you probably have. Usually what we mean by that is somebody who thinks they are really righteous. But also, you know, what, what he's saying in this, I think, is done, it's really against zeal, you know, against being fanatical about anything. And again, very typical of, of Greek wisdom especially, moderation is the best thing. Equally, don't be too wicked. Can you be a little bit wicked? Well, yeah, you know, it can be fun. But... Uh, don't be too wicked. <laughs> Moderation, he says, is the best. Uh, for why should you die before your time? All this I have tested by wisdom. I said I will be wise, but it was far from me. Uh, that which is far off and deep, who can find out? I turn my mind to know and search out and to seek wisdom. I found more bitter than death the woman who is a trap, whose heart is snares and nets, whose hard hands are fetters, one who pleases God escapes her, but the sinner is taken by her. Uh, this is what I found, he says, comparing one thing to another. One man among a thousand I found, and a woman among these I have not found. Would you say he was a misogynist? Anyone think he was? Well, I think you'd have to say he was probably misanthropic as well. <laughs> you know, uh, he's probably a little bit misogynistic. I mean, he seems to be, you know, a somewhat grumpy character, distrustful of people. Uh, maybe a little bit more distrustful of women. I think Ben Sira, who we'll meet next week, is worse in that regard. 
Now, all of them will make some allowance that you can also have a good woman. A good woman is usually a woman who does what man wants her to do. That's, that's typical again of the whole ancient world. Before class, I uh, was talking with uh, Georgia as to the, the relevance of a lot of the biblical material, and she was complaining about the, the uh, irrelevance, shall we say, of people's attitudes to women. I mean, it is certainly an area of biblical values um, that doesn't play too well in the modern world. But at the same time, you know, you won't find anything here that you don't also find in the modern world. So I don't think it's a problem of relevance. I think it would be a problem if you felt you had to agree with everything you read in the biblical text. We'll move on to chapter 9. All this I lay to heart, examining how the righteous and the wise and their deeds are in the hand of God. Uh, and I move over the hearts of all. Well, whoever is joined with all the living has hope, for a living dog is better than a dead lion. The living know that they will die, but the dead know that they get all. Which is better? Well, I think he is at least inclined to grant that it is better to be alive and know that you're going to die than to be already dead and know nothing. Um, they, the dead have no more reward, even the memory of them is lost. Their love and their hate and their envy have already perished. So, you know, it's a fairly radical perspective on life. Uh, you will get touches of this in the Gospels. In the Gospels, of course, it's qualified because you have the hope of an afterlife or the hope of a resurrection. But you will also get the idea that, you know, the person who accumulates wealth and hopes to, you know, to have it as it will last is kidding, is fooling himself. Because anything can be blown away. So his conclusion, go eat your bread with enjoyment. Drink your wine with a merry heart. For God has long, long ago approved what you do. Let your garments always be white. That sounds a lot like Gilgamesh. Do not let oil be lacking on your head. That's gone out of fashion. Enjoy life with the wife whom you love. So, you know, even though he hadn't found one woman in a thousand, <laughs> he does allow that one night you could have a wife whom you love all the days of your vain life because that is your portion and your toil. Now, this is almost exactly what the barmaid said to Gilgamesh, back in the Gilgamesh epic. Uh, in that case, uh, she said, hold on to the, the little one who holds on to your hand. Let your garments be clean, you know, enjoy, yeah, enjoy the life that is given to you, because that's what you've got. Now, from that, I think you would probably also argue that the main root of injustice is people wanting gain, wanting to get ahead, wanting to get an advantage over other people. From his point of view, all of that is pointless. Uh, again, Georgia before class called this an ethic of radical acceptance, and I think that's a, a fair enough description of it. The book ends with a fairly remarkable poem, I think, in verse 12. Remember your creator in the days of your youth, before the days of trouble come, and the years draw near when you will say, I have no pleasure in them. Before the sun and the light and the moon and the stars are darkened and the clouds return with the, wa with the rain. Now, some of this poem is obviously allegorical, the day when the guards of the house tremble and the strong men are bent. That's alluding to the body. The women who grind cease working. That's your teeth. 
Uh, those who look out the window see dimly, you know, everything begins to fade. Now, we will, before the end of this course, we have to some degree in some of the prophetic books, found passages that imagine the end of the world. Uh, it come, becomes more and more prominent in the New Testament period, in the apocalypse of John being the supreme example of it. Here you have a kind of existential apocalypse. That the world may not come to an end, Koheleth doesn't believe it does, but it does for any individual. And what happens to an individual here is kind of like the way things are said to fall apart. In, that in many ways, I think, what you get in the apocalyptic literature is the projection of the individual experience of life onto the whole world. And then he concludes, um, the wheel bro is broken at the cistern, the dust returns to the earth as it was, and the breath returns to God who gave it. That's fairly clear allusion to, Gen to Genesis. There aren't many biblical allusions in the book of Koheleth. I think he probably didn't know the book of the Torah. There have been attempts to make it seem that he was somehow expounding the Torah, but he wasn't, really. It's just incidental. He will quote something from the Torah if he thinks it's right, and that's it. But now, one of the most controversial things in the book is that there is an epilogue. There are several sentences that are added here at the end. Besides being wise, the teacher also taught the people knowledge. Okay, this is just like an editor saying, why did we collect this? The teacher also sought to find pleasing words and wrote the words of truth plainly. I think you could give him credit for that. He certainly wrote the truth as he saw it, plainly. The sayings of the wise are like goads, like nails fixed at the collected sayings that are given by one shepherd. Of anything beyond these, my child, beware. Of making many books, there is no end. Anybody going into the academic life should read and take this to heart. Uh, much study is a weariness of the flesh. Now, this is not, I think it's pretty obviously, actually not written by Koheleth. This is a comment on it. And really that the hub of what he's saying there is, of anything beyond these, my child, beware. This is a book now that became controversial as to whether it should be in the Bible or not. Now, I think eventually it was kept. Why was it kept? It was kept because it rang true to a lot of people. Now, there are a lot of sayings in the book of Koheleth that if you've got them in your head, you will find occasions in life where they seem to be bang on. And for that reason, I think the book was accepted in popular thought, uh, and it was not something you could drop. But, says the editor, okay, we'll keep this, but that's it. We don't want any more of this stuff. Anything beyond these, beware. This is the canonical impulse. Part of the idea of having a canon is to limit what you're allowed to read, or at least uh, what you can regard as authoritative. And then in verse 13, at the end of the matter, all has been heard. Fear God and keep his commandments for that is the whole duty of everyone, for God will bring every deed into judgment, including every secret thing, whether good or evil. Uh, my colleague, Carolyn Sharp, argued uh, in a book on irony in the Old Testament that this is the real message of Koheleth, and that all the rest of it was ironic. Now, I must say, I don't believe that for a moment. I think uh, if, if that was the case, the book failed spectacularly in what it was trying to do. Because really, this goes against the grain of the whole book. The whole book has been saying, to say that God will judge every deed of judgment is vanity and chasing after wind. 
So it may be, you know, that if you believe in an afterlife, that you can read Kohelet as ironic. But I don't think for a moment that that is what the way it was meant to be read. This was Kohelet's take on life, for better or worse. Back before we, we moved uh, to Yale 20 years ago, when I lived in Chicago, I used to do a Lenten series in my parish church. And one year I was doing wisdom literature, and we discussed Koheleth. The woman came up to me afterwards and she said, you know, I'm a nurse. I work with a lot of old people. They're all like that. And that, that, that was her summary of the book of Koheleth. Well, be that as it may, what do you think of it? Anyone want to voice a reaction to it? Nice Easter reading, isn't it? You know, it's the, if you think of the, the scriptures as a kind of smorgasbord, where you will get many different theologies proposed from time to time, this is one of them. It's still in there. It's still in the canon. And, you know, make of it what you will. In the end of the day, I guess, one, one accepts or relates to uh, that which strikes a chord with you, that which rings true. And that can vary a lot from one person to another. Gloria, did you want to voice that chat comment? No. Yeah, no. Um, um, you know, Sophia had some. Sophia had. Sophia had something before me, but I was just saying um, this. I think it, it's kind of sobering, and it, I can use it um, when I'm doing my chaplaincy work and, and social therapy work, you know, my um, clinical work. So I think it helps, you know, especially when people are, you know, have faced death or are facing death. Um, I think it's helpful. It's sobering because some people don't want to believe that, oh, God is going to take care of it. You know, they want to be here in the present now. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Sophie, I've seen it. <laughs> Sophie. Um, no, I think that's interesting. I was wondering, you mentioned something about um, the, the idea that breath returns to God who gave it being sort of yeah. a allusion to Genesis. And I wondered, like while I was reading, it actually occurred to me, and I wondered if there was sort of a case to be made that there is a theological influence of some kind from Genesis because um, specifically, there's sort of this idea that, um, you know, God, God gave us on some level, I don't know what gave, how gave operates here, but, you know, the ability to conceive but not fully understand, right, which I think sort of um, echoes the idea of the tree of knowledge. And there's a couple things in here, like right in the first chapter, um, I think in verse 13. Um, he calls like the desire to seek wisdom, the unhappy business that God has given to human beings to be busy with. And I sort of get a sense throughout this that, um, yeah, the sort of like paradox between God giving us life and pleasure, but also the, the thing that distinguish us, distinguishes us, like humans are no different than animals, but I think I can't remember exactly where there's also something in there that says that the ability to seek wisdom and sort of like in, you know, veiled understand, but not fully is um, the one thing that sort of distinguishes us from humans, but then it's not a pleasant thing. So um, yeah, I, I just wondered your thoughts on that. Yeah, um, you know, I think it is very similar point of view to what you get in the story of the first few chapters of Genesis, the story of Adam and Eve, which also you know, regards wisdom as off limits. So that wisdom is not something you can ultimately attain. And you know, the, the, in the end, you, you get life, the Lord giveth, the Lord takes, uh, taketh away, and the, uh, you return to the, the earth uh, from which you were taken. I think it's very much the same point of view. And I think then it quotes uh, Genesis in support of that. Whether it derived it from Genesis, I'm not so sure. I think he probably just derived it from his own reflections on life. 
but there's certainly a, a, a correspondence there. It fits. Okay, I guess we had better sign off. Um, happy Easter, everyone.